In this lecture, we will be looking at some of the roles counselors assume and functions they perform at various stages of the counseling process. During the initial stages of counseling, the primary goal of the counselor is to establish a structure and relationship with the client. Establishing structure is important because it allows the client to understand what counseling is and what they could expect from this process. It is during this structuring stage that you work on role induction. Role induction is a way for you to let clients know what they are expected to do in counseling and what they can expect from the process. It also allows the counselor to share what their roles are going to be in the therapeutic process. During this role induction stage, your goal will be to achieve informed consent from your client. To achieve informed consent, you need to share with the client all the different aspects of counseling that may be relevant for them to know before they can make an informed decision as to whether or not they would like to continue participating. Information that may be useful or helpful during this induction phase is sharing details about the logistics of counseling. How often will your sessions be scheduled? How long do the sessions last? How are fees and payments handled? During this time you may also talk about the roles that both you, the counselor, and the client will play. Depending on your theoretical orientation, these roles may vary. At times, the client may be more of an active participant. At times, the counselor may play a more active role. As the counselor, you may see your role more as a consultant or collaborator than as an expert. However you envision the process and your goals for working with that client will determine the roles that you play. At this time you also want to talk to the client about informed consent regarding confidentiality. Discussing with clients what the limits to confidentiality are and how those will play a role in the counseling process. Once you've managed the first stage and you have established the relationship with the client, you have shared with the client what it is that counseling is and what they could expect from this process, we can now start getting the ball rolling. Many times our challenge or our goal at this stage is to establish initiative in our clients. Initiative is the motivation or the desire to work, to achieve, and to affect change. Not every client that we see comes with strong initiative. There are some who may be coming against their will. There are some that may not be sure what the problem is. And there are some that may not be sure that they completely trust or understand what it is you as a professional could do for them. So as we work with clients and try to develop this initiative, it's important to understand where they are currently in terms of their readiness to change. When clients are not ready to change, the therapeutic process probably is not going to be very effective. Many researchers and practitioners will agree that clients 
of all types have some initiative and genuinely want to change their situation. Even those who are caught in bad situations or damaging effects of their signs and symptoms want to change their situation. While there may be some secondary gains that they get from having these, in an ideal world they still would rather not have these symptoms or these problems. There is a small minority, however, who are hesitant to change at all, who have really no desire to change. We could look at these individuals as falling into one of two different groups, those being reluctant and those being resistant. Clients who are reluctant typically resist change or have a negative attitude towards change because of there's a fear of the unknown. They're not sure what the other side looks like. No matter how bad their situation is now or how stressful their current functioning may be, it's familiar to them. They know what to expect. They could plan for and account for the distressing parts of their life. Should they change, there is a possibility things get better, but a possibility also remains that the situation gets worse. It's that unexpected outcome that causes them to be reluctant. An entirely different type of hesitancy is resistance. Resistance is an outward denial or rejection of participating in a change process. These are clients who are against change, not because they are unsure of what lies ahead, just because they don't want to change. They don't feel the need nor the desire to change. Resistance could come in many different forms in the counseling relationship. We may detect resistance in how clients interact with us, whether they stay silent, whether they become aggressive or confrontative or belligerent. We could see resistance in how they share information. Some clients may just give short one-word answers or very curt responses to our questions. We also could see resistance in terms of people canceling sessions, coming late to sessions, really not giving a full effort to the counseling process. When we encounter clients that we believe to be hesitant in some way, it's important to identify where they may be in terms of their decision to make a change. Knowing where they are in this change process helps us tailor our interventions and approach. One way that we can gauge where clients are is by looking at the trans-theoretical model of change. The trans-theoretical model of change was developed by Prochaska. It's a five-stage theory that explains how individuals become motivated to change. Each of us does not wake up one day, pop out of bed, and decide, I'm going to change today. I have spontaneously decided to make a change. While some do, it's not the norm. In fact, people are probably along a continuum of stages in terms of their readiness to make change. And so if we look at Prochaska's model, you'll see there are five stages. Pre-contemplation, contemplation, 
preparation, action, and maintenance. The pre-contemplation stage is also known as the not ready stage. These are individuals who are completely unaware of any need to make a change in their life. Because they do not see the need, they put no thought or take no effort or actions into trying to make the change. The contemplation stage is also known as the getting ready stage. These are individuals who at least will acknowledge that a problem exists, but they currently have no plans to work on it or affect change. An example could be an individual who knows that they're overweight and needs to lose a few pounds, but they have no current plans to begin dieting, exercising, or changing their health regimen. The third stage is preparation. This is the ready stage. Here, individuals acknowledge there is a problem. They have made the decision that they do need to make a change. And they've begun exploring their options. What is available to them? What are the pros and cons of each of those approaches? So our individual who is seeking to lose weight may have called a few gyms in the area to see about memberships, may have purchased some books on weight loss and diet, or contacted a trainer to begin setting up personal training sessions. This stage leads into the action stage or the changing stage. Here individuals begin activities designed to bring about change. During this action stage, the initial stages are going to be challenging for individuals. It's where the stress and anxiety associated with change are most prevalent. Eventually, the novelty of change wears off. The new actions and activities become habit and part of our daily routine. And we move into what's called the maintenance stage. The maintenance stage is also seen as the preventing relapse stage. At this stage, the person has already gone through the major legwork of making a change, and now they are just keeping it going. So our example, our individual has lost the weight that they wanted to lose, and now they're maintaining. They do not revert back to their previous unhealthy ways, but they continue with a new healthy lifestyle to maintain their weight loss. There are assessment interviews and intake protocols that you could use to assess where clients are on this model of change. There are also our objective survey questionnaires that give you a quantifiable number indicating where people are on this model. It certainly helps you identify what it is you need to do with your client to move them to the next stage of change. Your actions and interventions at the pre-contemplation stage would be much different than the actions you have at the preparation or action stage.
In addition to assessing readiness, you can also observe verbal cues from your client. These nonverbal cues provide you with a great deal of information about what may be going on and what the true nature of the problem is. You could look at the client's appearance and activity level. Are they manic, excited, tense and agitated, depressed or lethargic? Does their appearance look well kept? Do they look disheveled? Each of these gives us a clue as to what may be going on with the individual. What type of speech and language patterns do they use? How do they describe the problem or issue? Do they have insight? Are they coherent? Do they truly understand that there is a problem? And if they do, do they really understand the magnitude or the extent of the problem? We also could look at how clients react to particular questions. The types of responses or the visceral reaction they have to the question serve as red flags for us as to what may be areas we need to probe further in the future. When clients outwardly show they do not want to talk about a topic, chances are there's something about that topic that's very sensitive to them. And as rapport builds and we progress further into the counseling relationship, there may be a time in the future when they are more comfortable discussing that with us. We also want to see who presents with the client. This not only allows us a glimpse into understanding their motivation for coming, it also provides us with an understanding of what their support system may look like. Did the client come in with a parent, a spouse, friends or family? Were they brought in voluntarily or involuntarily? If brought in against their will or coerced to come or tricked into coming, initially they may be very resistant to participating. The more voluntary their participation, the more likely it is that they will engage you in the change process. In gathering information about their readiness to change, the nonverbal information you find, in addition to the information you collect during the intake, you could begin determining a level of care. What type of services does this person need? You may have a situation where there are no services needed. Perhaps this person may not benefit from true clinical or therapeutic work. We could look at outpatient programs, individual counseling, group counseling, partial programs, day treatments, or this person may need to be hospitalized for acute inpatient psychiatric observation to check their medicines, make sure they're safe, or long-term hospitalization. Each of these may be applicable to the client that you're working with. When determining the level of care, it's important to 
be aware of the role that managed care plays. While you may deem a certain level of care necessary for a client, that individual's managed care provider may share a different opinion. Finances play a role. If clients are unable to provide funding for their services and rely solely on their managed care provider or insurance companies, then we need to work with those companies within their guidelines and parameters as to what could be offered for that client and what types of services will be covered. Each provider has different guidelines that they go by and as you begin working with these you'll gain a better understanding of the types of services that will and will not be reimbursed. So now let's jump forward and assume that we have clients in the upper level of care they need to be. What are some things that you do in working with those clients? One of your primary goals will be to diagnose clients. Traditionally, we used a multi-axial system where we had five separate axes for diagnosing and describing the presenting issues of the client. On axis one, we included all psychiatric conditions except for personality disorders and mental retardation. These were coded on axis two to denote the fact that they were more lifelong or sustained illnesses as opposed to the transient or passing problems we diagnose on axis one. On axis three, we included medical conditions that the client may be experiencing. Axis four listed all the psychosocial stressors both good and bad, that may be playing a role in the client's life. And finally, Axis 5 included a global assessment of functioning. It was a subjective rating that counselors gave to indicate where clients were in terms of their functioning and handling of their problem. That traditional system has recently gone away. The release of DSM-5 has removed the multi-axial diagnostic system from the diagnostic nomenclature. Instead of having axes 1, 2, and 3 they have all been collapsed onto a single line. We now diagnose what the presenting issues are for a client, whether they be medical or mental in nature. Separate notation is required to gather the information that previously we got from axes 4 and 5. Now we want to be able to document contextual factors and disability levels of the client. To accomplish this, mental health providers will begin using the World Health Organization's Disability Assessment Schedule. The Disability Assessment Schedule is a multi-paged intake assessment which can be used to identify the context or the environment in which the problem occurs 
and the level of impairment it causes on the client's life. This information will now be included in the charts along with the presenting issues, medical or mental, that we note with the client. Once we diagnose a client, we could begin the case management phase. Case management really deals with all that we do with a client from beginning to end. How are we structuring the counseling process or experience for the clients? It's going to look different for each client as each comes in with a different problem or presenting issue, each with a different motivation, each with a different set of resources. The case management process provides us with a written game plan or set of directions for what we're going to do with that individual. It should be a game plan that other healthcare providers could easily follow. So in situations where additional providers may become active in the client care, whether they be other counselors, psychiatrists, medical doctors. Everyone is operating from the same perspective with the same goals in mind for that client and the same idea of what needs to occur. Because case management is the game plan for the client, a major component of it is the record keeping. Keeping good records ensures that we stay on task and we provide the best possible care for our clients. When working with clients, we often begin by opening a record. When opening a record, there are some guidelines to consider. You should review the ACA Code of Ethics for information on what should or should not be included in clients' records. You should also consult with the agency or mental health center with which you work as they may have their own specific guidelines for how records are kept and managed. It's important for you to also remember that records are for the client and the counselor. Many times it's easy to assume that it's just for our benefit as counselors, as a way to remember what we're working on with clients, where we've been, where we hope to be going. But it's also for the client as well. It's a way to keep clients accountable. It's a way for clients to understand what's going on in the treatment process. It's also a way for clients to ensure that their best interests are being maintained. So when we talk about a client record, we're talking about all the available information that we have or that we gather that is needed for a client treatment. The record will include several different types of information. Because it contains personal information about the client, confidential information, 
they must be safely stored. Client records should not be left out in the open, shared with other individuals who are not participating in the client's care, and should not be accessible to other clients. Different facilities have different procedures in place for safeguarding and storing records. So check with your employer and make sure that you are familiar with the policies and procedures related to record safety. Information we see in the record, any demographic information we complete about the client, This can include information about their date of birth, address, phone numbers, contact information, emergency contacts, any assessment data, intake assessments, any testing we conducted, results of those tests, interpretations, the treatment plan, the goals we set, session notes or case notes. These are the documentations we have after each individual session of what went on, what was accomplished. Any medical consultations, a termination summary when we end our work with a client. What is the game plan moving forward? What will the client be expected to do in lieu of coming to visit us at the center? Any consent forms that were signed, as well as any insurance information. And this typically includes copies of the client's driver's license, insurance card, names and phone numbers, of who to contact for service authorization. When compiling a client record, it's important to keep in mind whether we want minimal or maximum disclosure. Sometimes it's beneficial to have maximum disclosure. For particular issues, it's best if we document everything that occurs in as detailed and descriptive a manner as possible. Other times, we may want to be more minimal, either to protect client safety or confidentiality, or to eliminate any potential bias on our part. We may not document everything that occurs in a session. Discussions or topics around issues not related to the issues for which treatment is being sought or not germane to the topic at hand can be left out of the records. For example, a client may come in and talk about an argument they had with the spouse last night. That may be completely unrelated to any of the issues for which this person is seeking counseling. And through the course of the session, if we determine that it's not relevant to their functioning or their presentation at this time, we need not necessarily put that in the record. If, on the other hand, the client has had a change in presentation or been adversely affected by the argument, we certainly would then want to put that in the record as it is an important artifact 
to keep in mind. When writing case notes and keeping records, some suggestions for you. Make sure your notes are grammatically correct. This is going to be an official document that others will have access to. It increases your professionalism when your notes are grammatically correct and legible. Use precise language. What is it that the client actually says? Quotes sometimes are helpful to capture the true essence of the client's description. Record only the important or pertinent information. Eliminate your personal opinions. Anything that may incriminate you or your agency, or that is not grounded in fact, should not appear in the record. Your interventions should be related to your treatment plan. As we move further and further along on the evidence-based practice initiative, everything that we do with clients should be related to the treatment plan. Our actions and interventions all should be designed to help meet the goals that we establish. Should you make a mistake in a record, never use correction fluid or whiteout. Instead, you should take an ink pen, mark a line through the incorrect information, initial that you're making this change, and then write in the correct information. We never block it out or completely remove it. It's best to let others see what the error was and how it was corrected. When we remove it or block it out, questions arise as to what was initially there. Why was it removed? Was it an error? Or is it being omitted for an ulterior motive? A good suggestion for beginning counselors is to write your notes as soon as possible after sessions end. As you begin practicing as a counselor, you'll have days where you see many clients. By the end of the day, their stories and situations may begin to run into one another and you have difficulty discerning which story went with which client. Writing your notes immediately after the session is a good way to document while it's still fresh on your mind. The prevalence of this practice is actually a reason why the standard clinical session is 50 minutes in length. It allows you time to write some notes in advance of your next client coming in. And finally, it's important to sign and date all of your forms so that we know who's participating and when these decisions where evaluations were made. If documenting case notes in a chart, it's important to sign your name right after your entry. This way nothing else can be added to your entry or be misconstrued as your writing or your opinions and they may have been from someone else.
the records that we keep in the entire client record need to be kept for seven years following termination of that client for adults and three years for children. So as you write these records, keep in mind that this file will be around for quite some time. What you write in it now will be accessible to people several years down the road. When it comes to ownership of client records, it is in fact the client who owns the medical record. They have the right to determine who has access to that record. Their rights are governed by the HIPAA Act, the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. HIPAA stipulates that clients can view their files, make changes to their files, make copies of their files, and share access with others to their files. When access to others is desired, third-party release forms should be completed. Make sure that you have a documentation that the client, in fact, did authorize this individual to access their files. Releasing client files to an individual for which there is not a release form is a huge liability, even if it is the client's spouse, best friend, employer. When talking about ownership, it's also important to consider client competency. Making sure that clients are competent and mentally able to understand the decisions they're making. When competency may be an issue, we may need to conduct a mental status exam to determine whether there is any cognitive impairment that may diminish the client's ability to make informed decisions. A large part of the information we find in a client's record comes from the beginning sessions of our relationship with the client. It is during these initial sessions that we conduct intake assessments and gather a full range of information that will allow us to understand the client's problem in its proper context. Some of the information we collect during intake assessments never really avails itself in the counseling process. The goal here, however, is to gather as many pieces of information as we can so that later we're able to sort out what is needed and what is not, rather than getting to a point where we wish we had known something or we missed something earlier. Each agency employs a different intake assessment protocol. Some use standardized protocols, others create their own for their agency. In general, they all contain consistent types of sections or information sought. There is demographic information collected, There is a section that asks clients 
what their presenting concern or issue is, what's the history of that concern, how long has it been a problem, how is the current experience different than past, is there any family background, does this problem run in the family, is there a history of mental health treatment in the family. Have there been any significant life events? Marriage, divorce, death, newborn, home purchase, career change, anything that may play a role in determining client's current functioning. Is there any previous counseling or mental health experience? Has this individual seen a counselor? been treated by a psychiatrist, hospitalized before in any way? Are they suicidal? Are they homicidal? And finally, what are their goals and expectations for counseling? What is it that the client hopes to get out of this process? What do they see as a potential end result of their participating in counseling. Counselors also create treatment plans. A treatment plan takes the information gathered during an intake assessment and mobilizes it so that it can now be used to guide action in future sessions. The treatment plan explains why clients are receiving services and what's going to take place. There is a presenting issue. To address that presenting issue, we will be employing these techniques and strategies. When coming up with treatment plans, it's important to engage in a collaborative effort with your clients. The more input clients have into the process, the more personal the goals will be, and the more buy-in you have on the part of the client. When clients set their own goals, they're more likely to work towards achieving those goals rather than they would be if they were set by you alone. When you set the goals and clients do not achieve them, it's easier for them to rationalize why they did not achieve the goal by stating that it wasn't their goal, it's just what you wanted. But when they set the goal, and they don't achieve it, there's more of a personal letdown and they're typically more motivated to do it. Our treatment plans should include measurable treatment outcomes. They need to be specific it needs to be something that we could quantifiably see or measure in terms of success towards achieving that goal. A goal should not be the client is going to feel better. What does better look like? How do we document better? Some components of the treatment plan then. We have a problem statement. What is the problem? Client is having relationship issues with his spouse. From that problem statement, we can now get a goal statement. Okay, so we know there are relationship issues. What is our goal now? What are we working towards? client will have improved communication with spouse. 
What then are the treatment modalities we will employ to achieve that goal? Individual sessions, couples counseling, What is our clinical impression? Not only do we include our diagnosis of what the problem is, but our prognosis as well. Prognosis refers to our understanding of the likelihood for successful outcome in the future. When you go to the doctor and you ask for a prognosis, they list people as either being in stable condition, critical condition, fair condition. What's the likelihood that they'll get better? Same in this situation. Do we think this will be successful? Stating that we have a less than favorable prognosis does not necessarily mean we are negative towards our client. It means that we're being rational in making a decision based on all of the information we have. Clients may have few resources, be poorly motivated, have a prior track record of unsuccessful attempts to change, and so all of that may factor into our prognosis. And finally we want to list all the service providers who will be participating in this treatment plan? Who are these individuals and what will they be contributing? Counselors, doctors, case managers, occupational therapists, anyone who will be helping to assist in this treatment plan should be included. As noted earlier, the case notes or session notes are going to be used to document what it is that you're doing on a session by session basis with clients. The treatment plan outlines the overall goals and approach to take, but it's the case notes that actually provide the information of how well we're doing towards achieving those goals each time we meet with the client. Activities completed in our sessions should fall in line with the treatment plan. A third party should be able to look at our case notes and see, okay, I could see how they're working towards that goal. That seems to be a good approach to achieve that goal. Information that should be included in your case notes are confirmation of services. The client did attend. Were they on time? Were they late? You want to make sure that the correct billing code information is in there. That you're billing for the correct service, whether it was an individual session or a group session, a family or couple session. And there need to be original signatures of the counselor, documenting that this is in fact an accurate record of what went on. Several different formats can be used for your case notes. And again, the agency or setting in which you work probably has a standard format in which they like case notes to appear. These are some common case note formats used at mental health centers across the country. The first one is referred to as a SOAP note and all of these are acronyms. SOAP stands for Subjective Objective Assessment Plan. So the subjective is what the client comes in presenting with, what they're saying. The objective is what we observe signs and symptoms. A is assessment. What's the diagnosis that we make based on the collection of subjective and objective information? 
and P is our plan. What now will we do based on this information? Similar to the SOAP note is the DAP note. D stands for data, and that includes all the subjective or objective. It's everything that we gather information-wise about a client in our time together. A is assessment, and P is plan. STIPS S is a sign or symptom. So again, what is the information we're gathering? T is the topic of our discussion. What did we focus on in that session? There may be several presenting issues, and we may not get to each one in every session. So what was the topic for that particular session? I refers to the interventions. So what did we do in the session? P refers to progress or plan. What's our goal for next time, for the next coming sessions? And then S is any special issues. Was there any unique challenge or issue that arose? And then finally, a gap note. G stands for goal. What was our goal for that session? A is assessment. What did we do or assess to work on that goal? And P is our progress or plan. How well did we accomplish our goal? And what's our step for the next session? The same basic information is collected in each of these. How it's presented varies slightly from one type to another. It's best to check with your agency to see what their preferred style of case note might be. The last component of counseling that you do is the ending of your relationship with a client. This has been called termination. And termination is the last phase of counseling. And it's when a decision has been made, either by the client exclusively, the counselor, or a collaboration between the two to stop counseling services. This decision can be made for many different reasons. There is a growing trend towards moving away from the term termination as it has a negative connotation and instead using transition as a term. We don't necessarily terminate clients, we transition them to other levels of care. And sometimes it's not a level of care provided by a professional. We could transition an individual to their family, their home community, and those will be the individuals responsible for assisting them in the future. And so there's a process of initiating termination. It should not be sprung on a client spontaneously. With five minutes left to go in a session, you should not then tell the client, by the way, this is our last session together. Instead, adequate preparation time should be given to the client to begin the process of termination. It's recommended that you usually begin several weeks in advance when you anticipate that you're coming toward the end of the time with a client. For some clients, there will be an initial shock. They may actually fear whether or not they can handle their situation on their own. 
a temporary relapse may occur where symptoms come back or they revert back to prior maladaptive behaviors. Because these are common occurrences, we want to take a couple of sessions to help reassure clients that they have made progress, they have made gains, they're a different person now, and that they can handle this on their own. By having several weeks to prepare, closure can be gained and clients could feel more comfortable about moving on to the next phase of their life. In documenting the termination, you will have a termination or transition summary that will go into the client record. Information that you include in this summary is what your initial assessment was when this client first came or presented for treatment. What were they exhibiting? What were they stating? What did you observe as their problem? What then was the treatment plan established for that client? What were the goals to be worked on? What interventions were employed? And what was the outcome? You also include an evaluation of their current level of functioning. And for context, contrast that to their prior level of functioning when they came for treatment. How have they grown? How have they changed? You want to include the rationale for the termination. Why are sessions ending now? Is it a financial decision? Have goals been achieved? What is your final diagnostic impression? So what is your prognosis for the future? Will this person be successful going forward? Do you believe they have the skills and abilities needed to keep these new changed behaviors going? Going back to the readiness model, these would be people in the maintenance stage. And then finally, a detailed follow-up plan. What is the person to do next? Are they going to be referred to another provider? Will they need to come back for follow-up sessions? What can they do if they have problems that arise? Are they able to call you? Can they schedule another session? Will they need to register as a new client again? So all of this information should be included as your follow-up and be documented in your termination summary. So we talked about rationale for termination and why clients... Okay. There are several reasons why clients and counselors may end relationships or clients may need to be referred elsewhere. There may be situations where problems arise that are beyond your competency that you neither have the training nor experience in dealing with and it's then best for the client to see someone who's more adept at being able to help their issues. There may be someone who's more helpful nearby. There may be an expert in a field who certainly could help that individual. There may be incompatible personalities. For one reason or another, a strong working alliance was never established. Or we could have relationships that stall in the initial stages. We're never able to get a good feel of what the client's problem was. Together, you and the client couldn't work out goals that you both felt comfortable with. And so it may be best then to end the relationship and refer to another professional rather than trudging on forward working in what will definitely be not a very conducive environment 
for therapeutic change. So the role of counselor is quite varied. There are many different activities that you will conduct from the moment you first see a client all the way through your last interactions with that client. At the various stages, there's a lot of documentation that you will do. And so becoming familiar with the counseling process, your agency or settings, rules and regulations, and fitting those in with your counseling style will benefit you professionally for years to come.